evening. Good evening, good afternoon, dear friends, dear Father Lawrence. Thank you very much for joining and uh, spending with us your time and knowledge. Uh, dear friends, thank you very much for being here and participating in our educational series. Um, certainly looking forward to um, a very inspiring presentation. Uh, just to remind you that on um, uh, Sundays, we at the different times, although it depends on where the lecture is located, lecture is located, we having presentations of various uh, Christian subjects, art, architecture, um, Bible studies, etc. in English, and on Mondays and Thursdays, we have them at uh, noon Eastern time or at 8 p.m. Moscow time in Russian. Um, you know, we certainly be most happy to expand our a list of activities if you'll come up with this subjects because we all for furthering, especially during this challenging time, that very uh, special and I believe instructional and beneficial activity. Father, I'm uh, turning microphone and camera to you. I'll be turning myself off, but I'll be I'll be right here. Yes. I'll be right here. So thank, thank you very much, and the word to you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. My, my, my pleasure. Thank you, Father. Um, well, God bless you. It's good to see our faces, or at least your names anyway. Um, um, Father Ilya uh, 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 kindly invited me to uh, talk with you, and I, su I suggest the topic might be about, uh, about Christmas. It's sort of kind of seasonal. I guess if you're on the, maybe not the old calendar, I think if you're on the Armenian calendar, the Armenians, as I understand, celebrate their Christmas on January the 7th, which on their old calendar uh, makes it for January 19th. So it's kind of Armenian. You could say it's either a Armenian Christmas or uh, very late for our Christmas or perhaps wildly early for the next Christmas. But at any rate, to talk a little bit about uh, what the Christmas shepherds thought that they were uh, being introduced to. You will recall, of course, the story of the Christmas shepherds in Luke's Gospel, um, uh, chapter 2, when the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around about the shepherds, uh, frightened them, it was very spectacularly, and the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be assigned to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. So the, the presence of the Christ was announced to the Christmas shepherds. The question, of course, is what did they expect when the announcement came that Christ had been born? And I ask the question because we who know the story of Jesus, we tend to read the story of the life of Christ into the early first century and, and second temple expectations of what the Messiah, when we talk about, for example, in in literature, where we talk about uh, a Christ figure, we're talking about a sacrificial figure, we're talking about someone that is the good shepherd that uh, takes uh, pastures the lambs and takes care of the flock, the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. We think about possibly the Savior who had nowhere to lay his head. We think, of, in fact, about the humility that characterized the ministry of Jesus Christ, and we say, that's what Christhood is, that's what a Messiah is. We, if, anachronistically read this understanding of messiahship back into the old testament and that's actually not what the uh, what uh, the shepherds were expecting first a uh, little etymology the word uh, christ in english uh, comes from the greek word christos uh, which is in turn derived from the greek word creo meaning to anoint so a christos is an anointed person and it is in fact the transliter uh, the translation of the hebrew mashiach which of course means an anointed person, which is to say the king, the Messiah or the Messiah was the anointed king that was expected to come and reign over the people of Israel and exalt them to a place of, of uh, prominence and restoration. Um, uh, in our day, we, we, we're thinking at least in, in, in the English tradition anyway, if you make a king, what you make a king by crowning him, once you, your person is just, I guess, uh, the, the, uh, heir apparent and then you crown the person and then the person becomes the monarch you become a king by crowning it was otherwise in ancient israel you became a king by being anointed when, uh, when samuel for example wanted to uh, choose a successor for king saul after king saul blew it pretty spectacularly um, uh, uh, samuel anointed him and then had the sense to get out of there as fast as he could so you, the the anointed the mashia the the Christos, the, the Christ, is the anointed one, the come who comes to be king over Israel. So when the Jews talk about the Christ, um, 
they talk they talk about King Messiah, or if you like, the Lord Messiah. So Jesus Christ, Christ is not, as you probably all know, uh, Christ, sir, uh, Jesus' surname, as if he were, you know, the Jesus, the child of Mr. and Mrs. Christ, or something like that. We talk about Jesus Christ, we mean Yeshua, Jesus the Mashiach. Yeshua, Mashiach, uh, Jesus Christ, the Jesus who is the Messiah, the Lord, the King of Israel. That's what the shepherds, uh, um, that was the announcement that the angels gave to the shepherds. So the question is, what did they think was happening in the Messiah? And what to say, it's important to recognize that the, um, the concept uh, a Messiah underwent a fair bit of development and evolution from about the 1000 AD when it, when it all began. It all began, of course, with King David. Uh, King David, uh, the shepherd boy, uh, and in fact, the uh, guerrilla leader, as he was after he was on the run from Saul, um, uh, became king of Israel. He, uh, the house of David replaced the house of Saul. And after David was installed uh, in Jerusalem, which then, then became the city of David, he thought that he would had a this brilliant insight, this brilliant this, uh, stroke of genius. He thought that he would bring the ark from where it was to his city, so that therefore, for all of Israel, all the tribes, if you wanted to offer sacrifice, you would go to where the ark was. That's the theory, anyway. Uh, they, they tended to offer sacrifices on the high places, which was strictly forbidden. But the theory was, if you wanted to offer sacrifice three times a year, all the males of Israel were required to go to wherever the portable ark shrine was located and offer sacrifice there. And by bringing the ark into his city, David, at a stroke, uh, made the religious capital of Israel uh, um, coinciding with his civil capital. So all of the tribes of Israel would be united around his capital, genius stroke that no doubt came from God, um, to unify the tribes of Israel around him. And so he began, when, his, uh, when his reign was secure, then he thought uh, he'd, I, that he would do what all kings did. And when you look at the kings of the ancient Near East, they showed their greatness by building projects. Uh, it continued even for King Herod, it comes to that. Um, but all of the ancient kings showed how pious they were by building, or if you like, restoring the temples of their gods. And so David thought, that's what I'll do too. I need a palace to live in. And in fact, God needs a palace to live in. Um, the, uh, the shrine. And he thought, this is, you know, our God is the supreme God. Our God is the living God. Our God is greater than all of the other gods of all of the other nations. They have temples of wood and of stone. They have these uh, prominent shrines. And our God, his dwelling place is a tent, like like, like, like the tents of, of, a, of a Bedouin. And that, that can't be right. So I will show what a wonderful king I am by building a tremendous uh, uh, shrine for God. I will build him a temple. And he checked out the plan with the court prophet, Nathan, who gave him the prophetic thumbs up. Um, and then he was going to build. Turns out that Nathan had spoken uh, a little bit prematurely. And, they, and so Nathan, perhaps a little sheepishly, had to return to David with the word from the Lord. And the word from the Lord was uh, essentially putting David in his place in a sweet sort of divine way. And to say, no, 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 no. You're not going to build a house for me. I will build a house for you. And of course, it's a, it's a play on words in the original Hebrew. The word for house is the word beth, which can mean a structural house that you live in or uh, a house, a temple for the God. And it can also mean your dynasty. So what God is saying that to, to, to David is that you are not going to build a structural house for me, but I will build a dynasty for, for you. And God said to him, look, from the time that I liberated Israel from Egypt, I've been going about from tribe to tribe, dwelling in tents, and in, in all of those hundreds of years, have I ever spoke to any of the tribes of Israel and said, why have you not built me a house of cedar? No. So God was completely satisfied with the tent, but, um, uh, but he would uh, condescend to accept the building project, not from David, but from David's descendants, which is to say from Solomon. And so but God did promise that he would build a house for David. And he said, I have taken you from, from the sheepfold and I made you king over over Israel, and I will establish your house, house of David, your dynasty, so that it is secure. And if your sons, which is to say, if your descendants, if this anyone in this line of kings messes up, I paraphrase, um, messes up, I will correct him with the stripes of men, in other words, I'll flog him, I'll, they will discipline him, but I will not take the rulership, I will not take the monarchy, I will not take the authority away from your sons as I took it from 
um, from King Saul. <clears throat> your, di <clears throat> your dynasty will be secure forever. The house of David will reign over Israel forever. And so uh, you know the story of the rest of the Old Testament. David died and slept with his fathers, and Solomon had this tremendous building program that he paid for with uh, uh, Israelite taxes, a lot of Israelite taxes. And after Solomon died and slept with his fathers, the, the people were saddled with a tremendous burden of taxation and debt and essentially uh, forced slavery for some of the people. And his son Rehoboam, um, uh, when he uh, uh, became king, the delegation from all of the 12 tribes came to him and said in a kind of respectful way, O king, live forever. Now, could you ease up on the taxes? You know, we, we, you, we're, we're being crushed on this burden of taxes. Please lighten our load. And he said, give me a minute to think of it. And he went back to talk to, to his advisors. And the old guys of, of his advisors said, look, if you accede to their request, they'll love you forever. He said, could be. Then he talked to his young contemporaries. And they said, no, 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 no. If they, have, if they smell weakness on you, they'll, they'll devour you. No, you got to take a strong thing. You got to not accede to their request. You got to say, my father disciplined you with, with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. No deal. No lightning of the load. Okay. That seemed to be a better ideal, possibly because it uh, stroked his ego. So the, the delegation came back and he delivered that message to them. Look, he, he says, my, well, nice, my finger is thicker than my father's loins, he said. He said, my father disciplined you with whips, I will disciplined you with scorpions, no lightning of the load. So there was a tremendous rebellion in Israel and most of the tribes said to your tents, David, look to your own house, we're out of here, essentially. So they would just, the Israel split between the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, and most of Israel stopped following the house of David. So now you had, instead of one united kingdom, you had the, the, the uh, Israel in the north, and you had Judah in the south. David's tribe remained loyal to him, of course, but now you had Israel and Judah, and Israel eventually went their own way, worshiping uh, the Baalim. Israel was sent off into um, captivity uh, under the Assyrians in the, in the 8th century, and uh, uh, the, the southern kingdom messed up too, and God judged them through the hands of the, of the Babylonians. The Babylonians came and destroyed the temple and sent them into exile in about 586 BC or, or, or so, and that was the end of the kingdom. And so well, people looked back at this and said, hold the phone. It was supposed to, the, the, David's descendants are supposed to reign over the house of Israel forever. How did we get into this mess? And it seemed like, and, and the prophets were there to say, God will restore. God is true to his word. A king will return. You will be brought back from Israel. Even the hopes uh, for national glory are completely dead. Israel, and during the exile, extinguished, uh, experienced national extinction. Their hopes were dead. As, how dead? As dead as uh, dry bones whitening in the sun. That's, easy, that's from Ezekiel's prophecy of the dried bones. But nonetheless, because God is the living God, God would uh, grant a national resurrection to Israel. He would bring them out of captivity. He would restore them and all the provinces for, for restoration and glory would finally come true when they would come after exile. And so I wanted to read with you some of the words of the prophets because this is what Israel was, was expecting. They listened to the words of the prophets and they they were waiting for God to fulfill his word. So, for example, in Isaiah 32, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a covered from the tempest, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will hearken. The mind of the rash will have good judgment, and the tongue of the stammers will speak readily and distinctly. No, but the fool will no longer be called noble, nor the knave honorable. For the, spool, for the fool speaks folly, his mind plots iniquity to practice ungodliness. But that's one prophecy in, in Isaiah. Other prophecies as well. For example, the prophecy of restoration after the exile coming from Isaiah chapter 42. Thus says Yahweh, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice nor make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly 
uh, burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not fail or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait for his law. And then one more passage in uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 23. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he'll be called. Yahweh is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when men shall no longer say, as Yahweh lives, you brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as Yahweh lives, you brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he has driven them. Then they shall dwell in their own land. So you had these prophecies, but they were the prophecies, not just that a king would rule and you would have the old status quo restored. No, the prophecies were such that it will be better that it ever has been, uh, that it ever has before. So a couple, few more prophecies that informed the hope of Israel. This is what the King Messiah would bring to Israel. This is what Israel would, would be like during the days of the Christ. From Isaiah chapter two. In the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as a chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to that mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He will render decisions for many peoples. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. Or we can turn a few pages in the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of Yahweh is risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. But Yahweh will rise upon you and his glory will appear, will appear upon you. The nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar. Your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you and the wealth of nations will come to you. The multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They'll bring gold and incense and will bear good news of the praises of Yahweh. All the flocks of Cato will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They'll go up with acceptance on my altar and I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like the doves to the lattices? Since surely the coastlands will wait for me and the ships of Tarshish, pretty far away, will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, in the name of Yahweh your God and the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Foreigners will build up your walls, kings will minister to you, for I have struck you in wrath, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually, they will not be closed day or night, so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations, with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will be utterly consumed. The glory of the Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, the cypress together to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will play, make the face of my feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing down to you, and those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you Yahweh's city, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And just one more. We paint a picture of the glory that people were expecting that the Messiah to bring. Behold, I created new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her peoples for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping, the sound of crying. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100 and the one who does not reach the age of 100 shall be thought accursed. They shall, build, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. 
They shall do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says Yahweh. So that's the hope. That's what the Messiah was expected to bring. And so the people had the hope that when Israel came out of exile, that's what was going to happen. God would bring them home out of exile. God would raise up David for them, which is to say the, the son of David, the, the Davidic Messiah, and those glory days would finally come. And, and it looked like it was going to happen. After uh, essentially a lifetime, well, okay, 50 years, but uh, lifetime-ish, you know, after uh, many generations, Cyrus the Great, like uh, uh, um, the Persian king who succeeded the Babylonians and took over the Babylonian Empire, allowed Israel and the other nations to return home and to build a temple. And so a few of them did return from the exile, um, but the existence that they had, they're expecting the glory days, they're expecting a new heaven and a new earth, they're expecting Jerusalem, a place for rejoicing. And it wasn't. They were just a few people. They didn't even fill the land. Instead of filling the whole land, the, the, the land of the 12 tribes, just if you had made a life for themselves, they made a home for themselves in Babylon, you know, I know the, uh, Feinstein's Jewish food restaurant or something like this, or whatever they, whatever they had there. But they were, they, they had prospered. They put down roots. A lot of them didn't want to come. They were quite happy where they were. But a few intrepid souls came and they were, in, they did not fill the land. Um, they mostly just lived in and around Jerusalem in, in the old country of Judea. So that's why the term, that's where the fact that's where the word Jew came from. A Jew is someone who lives in Judea. Um, so all of the ones that came back, from, regardless of which of the 12 tribes you came for, eventually came to be known as the Jews because they lived there. But they were waiting for the king to come. And the glory days that the King Messiah this king reigning in righteousness with princes coming to them didn't happen. They were, they remained a tiny little province of the Persian empire, plaything among the great nations of the earth. And then the Persians were replaced essentially by a war between Egypt and Syria. And then where the and, and Antiochus Epiphanes came and uh, essentially desecrated the temple. That's what Hanukkah was all about. The, the Maccabees restored a little bit of independence and the Maccabees were ruling uh, Judea independently. And it soon became apparent that the Maccabees were but as cruel, ruthless, and brutal as the Persians and Antiochus Epiphanes. This was not the days. And then, and then the Romans came with Pompeii in 63 BC, and, Ju and Judea became a Roman province. And before they were the plaything of the Persians, then the plaything of the Syrians, the Macedonians, and, and, and now of Rome. Where was the hope of, of, of the Messiah? But Israel never forgot, they never stopped hoping that the Messiah would come. And they nurtured that hope. They read and reread and re reread the, the prophets and nurtured those hopes. And they continued to write literature on themselves. So for example, the book of Enoch was written, the uh, book of Enoch is a composite book. It was written about this time. And they are still waiting for the Lord of Spirits to come, to send, to send the Messiah. It talks about, for example, in the book of Enoch, um, one of the chapters, the judgment of the kings and the mighty and the blessedness of the kingdoms. It talks about the elect one, the chosen one, the Messiah. And uh, so here it talks about um, the Messiah that is coming. The Lord of spirits seated him on the throne of his glory and the spirit of righteousness was poured upon him and the word of his mouth slays all the sinners and all the unrighteousness are destroyed before his face. And there shall stand up in that day all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who hold the earth and they shall see and recognize how he sits on the throne of his glory and righteousness is judged before him and no lying word is spoken before him. Then, then shall pain come upon them as upon a woman in travail. When her child enters the mouth of the womb and she has pain of bringing forth. And one portion of them shall look unto another. They shall be terrified. They shall be downcast of countenance and pain shall seize them when they see the son of man sitting on the throne of his glory. And the kings and the mighty and all who possess the earth shall bless and glorify and extol him who rules over all who is hidden. For from the beginning, the Son of Man was hidden, and the Most High preserved him in the presence of his might and revealed him to the elect. And the congregation of the elect and the holy shall be sown, and all the elect shall stand before him on that day. And all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who rule the earth shall fall down before him on their faces and shall worship and set their hope upon that Son of Man and petition him and supplicate for mercy at his hands. And on it goes. That was the hope of the Messiah. 
that they were expecting the Messiah not to be a gentle shepherd that would be kind to the sinners and the tax collectors. They were expecting not that the, the Messiah to be one who had nowhere to lay his head. They were certainly not expecting the Messiah to be a carpenter or to come from a family that they knew. But that's what they were expecting. They were expecting the chosen one, the son of man, the, the Lord of spirits would exalt to a position of supremacy, to exalting Israel to a position of glory in the world. They were in fact expecting a military Messiah. Uh, the, when, they, when, when John and our, our Lord after him said the kingdom of heaven, or if you like, the kingdom of God is at hand, that's what they were expecting. Right now, the kingdom belonged to the nations of the earth. It belonged, in fact, to Caesar. But when the Messiah came, when the Lord Christ, the King Messiah, would exalt Israel to a position of prominence and glory in the world and would shed Roman blood. The Messiah was not supposed to shed his own blood, thank you very much. The Messiah is supposed to shed the blood of the Romans, the blood of the oppressors, the blood of Israel's enemies exalting Israel to a position of uh, prominence and glory in the earth. Everyone was expecting that. That's where the people uh, in uh, uh, the Qumran communities, so-called Dead Sea communities, were expecting there would be a great war b b b between the sons of light, that's them, and the sons of darkness, that's the Gentiles, and possibly everybody else. Um, uh, and, but, and the King Messiah would be triumphant over that. So you see why when, when Christ came as a lamb to the slaughter, when he was arrayed in the, court, in the gorgeous purple of mockery and stood before Pilate in humility like a lamb, uh, is silent before it shears, that the people thought that they had in fact been had. They thought that he was the Messiah when they welcomed him into uh, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, they were expecting him to declare his power and overthrow Rome. And it seemed as if he was not gonna overthrow Rome. Rome was in the process of overthrowing him. He was about to be crucified any time. So, he can't be a Christ. He must be a false Christ. He can't be a true man of God. He can't be a true prophet. He must be a false prophet, the one who leads the people astray, which is why Israel and the people of Jerusalem turned on him so quickly and so spectacularly on that first Good Friday, because they believed that they had been had, that uh, that he was, this is not the Messiah. This, uh, the Messiah was supposed to be a political figure. So what you had in the church is you had a reinterpretation of messiahship. You had the, the, the uh, um, when you lay the, the grid of the life of Christ over all of the Old Testament prophecies, you see that they are fulfilled, they are fulfilled in a different way. That what was being predicted was not a glorified uh, nation, but a glorified king, a glorified messiah. And the kingdom of God, as the Lord said, at his, at the last earthly day of his life, was not of this world. The kingdom of God would be, would be spiritual in nature. The kingdom of God cons consisted of God's taking sinners and forgiving them. The kingdom of God could, consisted of taking the guilty and declaring them vindicated. It consisted of the healing of the human heart so that all of the nations of the world would come to the heavenly Zion. Christ was exalted, not politically, but spiritually. He was not ruling from Zion. He was ruling from heaven, or if you like, from the heavenly Zion. And the, the, all of the nations would indeed come to worship the Messiah, falling on before him, as the book of Enoch said, but this is from his throne in heaven. And now salvation is this spiritual reality where we are incorporated into Christ's kingdom through our, through our baptism. The Messiah has been glorified and we experience glory insofar as we are incorporated through our baptism and through our faith into him as well. So no doubt when the Christmas shepherds heard the word from the angels, Christ uh, has been born for you in the city of David. They were expecting that Rome's days were numbered. Um, and, and they were wrong about that, but they, because the whole concept of messiahship had to be reinterpreted through the life of Jesus Christ. And all of the parables that Christ told um, uh, were to say, you are, you're misunderstanding the kingdom of God. You know, as far as they were concerned, the kingdom of God was a political reality. It was a military reality in which evil men would be extinguished from the world. And he says, no. For example, in, in, the, in, the, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, our Lord said, oh, the, the, the wheat and the tares, the good and the evil will grow up together throughout this age. They'll not be separated until the age to come. Well, the kingdom of God is not going to be a political military reality where by the criminals are finally thrown out. No, he said that the kingdom of God is like a dragnet and you would, you, uh, 
fishermen would know that when you have a dragnet, it catches all the good fish and it catches the bad fish as, as well, brings them all together. And so it's not until the dragnet is brought to shore in the age to come at the, at the second coming at the end of the world that the, the fish are separated one from another. You keep the good fish, you throw out the bad fish. But that separation of good and evil does not take place until the final end. The kingdom of, in the kingdom of God, the good and the evil grow up together. The good fish and the bad fish are all, are all together there um, that all might have a chance to repent and finally uh, come to Christ and come to life in the age, in the age to come. The Christian faith uh, uh, was, was rejected by many people in Israel who did not have, if I may say, the humility and the spiritual flexibility to allow their hope to be reinterpreted, to allow their hope to be transcended, to, uh, to say that we, the, we, are, we are offered this su uh, supreme reality. We're offered something better by God. We wanted a military messiah. God is not offering a military messiah. He is offering us eternal life. He is offering us the possibility for the healing of the heart. Christ is not reigning from Jerusalem because if he reigns from Jerusalem, then you got to have armies and you got to have all of the wonderful things that attend the nations of the world, black ops, spies, all that sort of thing, all the government corruption. But Christ reigns from the heavenly Jerusalem, um, doesn't need uh, military might, doesn't need spies, doesn't need black ops. Um, they, we were offered a transcendent kingdom that is not of this world and that therefore this world cannot be overthrown. If you identify the kingdom of Christ with an earthly reality, like for example, Byzantium, um, then you're gonna find that the kingdom of eventually, maybe like in 1453, uh, the kingdom of God is, is not of this world. Byzantium fell because all the kingdoms of this world, after they rise, they all fall, without exception, every single one. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, was not established by military might and cannot be overthrown by military might. Christ sits securely on his throne because he's been glorified by God. And that's the kingdom that the, the, that the shepherds were offered. That's the kingdom that we are offered as well. Uh, perhaps I could uh, stop now to leave lots of time for questions. I'm not quite sure when, when the plug is pulled on us, uh, but I didn't want to uh, go well, on. There is, uh, dear Father, there is no, really no plug to pull at all. There is no plug to pull at all, and thank you for a wonderful thing. You know, please just keep talking. I'm ready to listen for you to you indefinitely. Um, uh, Father, uh, I wanted to ask you the following. Um, uh, being that we're a modern man, being that we're a modern man, uh, the anticipation of the biblical text is very historical and chronological. As you know, our... Um, brothers and sisters of Protestant formation truly sends uh, millions of dollars trying to find the evidence for every biblical text. They don't see any parable, they don't see any pastoral message or what have you. Uh, what would your take be on the uh, nativity narrative in general? Uh, I'm not asking and not suggesting that it's a completely made up story, although certainly there are a lot of Old Testament allusions, prophecies and things of that nature. But how do you think we as Orthodox who are trying to be a bit sober-minded and merge uh, historical traditional interpretation and patristic at the same time also equipped with modern scholarship and uh, biblical criticism can approach the story in general? Thank you. Um, um, I would, the, uh, the challenge for us as Orthodox, I, um, and it, and please let me know if, I, if I'm somehow dancing around your question and not answering it. So, but, but I would suggest that the challenge and the task for Orthodox people is to have uh, a patristic for the name, a, 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 a patristic approach, a patristic mindset, but to embrace scholarship as well. The temptation, of course, is to do what is to pick, is to say, I'm going to go by the fathers and who cares about scholarship or science or anything like that. Um, that's not so great. Or you could just say, I'm just, uh, forget the fathers, who needs them? They're all dead guys, you know? So, so I'm just going to go by uh, scholarship and science. I would suggest that you need both. It's a little difficult, and one's tempted sometimes to say exceedingly rare, but we need to both have a sense of scholarship and a, a patristic understanding of the authority of the text. Um, and I would say that if you embrace uh, good scholarship, because when, um, uh, there's good scholarship and there's bad scholarship, you know, and, when, and you, so you got to, 
there can be a destructive scholarship, which is a, a kind of rooted in a, a hermeneutic of suspicion, you know, you got, uh, that that I'll, I'll pass on, thank you very much, because I think it contradicts the, uh, the patristic mindset, which we are, which we are called to, to bring to our, our study of the text. But there is a good conservative scholarship that is consistent uh, with the text. And I think part of this uh, um, patristic scholarship or uh, a patristic friendly scholarship would say that when you're looking at the gospel accounts, especially in Luke, you're, you're getting something that is essentially historical. Now, of course, Luke writes history the same as it, the way the ancients wrote history, largely because he was ancient. So no ancient wrote history in the same way that, that we do. Our sense of history is to uh, try to uh, account for all of the facts and be fair and be balanced and stuff like this. That's not how the ancients wrote history. The ancients made a selection of the facts in order to make their point. And so in Matthew's gospel about Herod, uh, there's lots of good things that can be said about Herod. Matthew says none of them because he wants to focus in on the fact that Herod was essentially murderous, because he was. Uh, he was also a great builder. Um, uh, Herod, Herod was also somebody who elevated paranoia to an art form, essentially. But the point is Matthew and Luke um, wrote history the way that ancient people wrote history uh, to make, to serve their pre-selected agenda and purpose uh, and um, in, in this case, in the, well, in, in the case of Matthew, to show how Christ fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament, um, in the case of, of, of Luke, to show how Christ was, was the savior of all men. Um, and Luke's uh, historical credentials are actually pretty good. He makes, he makes a point of, um, of uh, digging into the historicity. So for example, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, when he, uh, uh, narrates the various local titles of the of the rulers. Um, ancient people thought all the various titles that he used, he, he's, he's making that up. Then they dug around archaeologically, uh, um, and they and, and they and they discovered those very titles in, in little bits of archaeology that they dug up. So Luke's uh, Luke was vindicated, and the skeptics needed to stand down and possibly get a real job. So they. Uh, Luke has a, a good track record for his historicity. And so and you could really gather that he, he starts off in his opening a thing by saying that he is, he is trying to uh, write his, his story based on eyewitnesses. Luke, Luke, Luke chapter one, uh, the initial verses read, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, O most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. So Luke makes the point of saying, I'm talking to guys who are eyewitnesses who were there and saw the whole thing. And the nice thing about Luke's account, uh, or come to that, the uh, Matthew's account too, is that it was written from uh, by the church within, uh, how do you say it, a matrix of hostility. Well, the things that they were saying were spectacularly controversial. There were any number of their Jewish brothers and sisters who were looking at them with a very jaundiced eye indeed. And so if you play fast and loose with, uh, with the facts, they're instantly going to contradict you, you know, um, because pe people would be there. And if you say, this happened then, um, if you were wrong about that, any number of people that, uh, like uh, the, uh, the, um, the Jews that wanted to contradict Paul's adversaries would say, nope, wrong, wrong, you got that wrong, I was there, and they would, they, they, they would kind of call you on it. So this matrix of opposition, shall we say, if not outright hostility, had the effect of keeping the, the evangelists honest in their presentation of the facts. They couldn't play fast and loose with them. Um, uh, if you... Um, you, that, that includes chronology and that includes the basic facts. What they would disagree upon, for example, is the significance of those facts. So for example, the fact that Jesus did miracles um, is denied by, by no one. The Jews did not uh, uh, deny that he did miracles. Um, if you said that he did miracles and he didn't do miracles, any number of people would, would, would be there to say, no, I was there, he didn't. What the 
the disagreement came in in the significance of the miracles. The Israel was saying, yeah, he did miracles, all right, but he did them by the power of Satan. He practiced the, the phrase in the Talmud is uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Yeshua, um, practiced sorcery and led Israel astray. That's the little bit in, there's some other things in the Talmud as well. But, but the fact that he did miracles or that he claimed to be God is not denied by anyone. Um, the Christians say the miracles were miracles of God and his claims for divinity were true. Israel said his miracles were demonic miracles and his claims to divinity were delusional and sane lies. Uh, but what he did and said um, you, you, uh, is agreed by both parties of, uh, um, in the dispute and in the controversy. And so I would suggest that, that uh, the, the, the fact that this is the metrics in which these things were were written and debated in the early days, uh, like I said, provides a control and a guarantee of the substantial historicity of the narrative. You, you can you can you can debate what went on. You can debate the historicity of the flood if you want. You can debate the historicity of a lot of things in the Old Testament. Um, you can debate the historicity of things that took place maybe a thousand years ago, but the controversial things that that are, that are happening now, you can't really you can't you can't really debate. So I, I would suggest that. Um, if, if modern man wants to look at it and says, how do you know that that happened? Is because it was written with uh, just a few decades ago. It, it, it's significant that, like I said, it happens, Luke wrote his gospel when um, sufficiently early that most of the eyewitnesses were still alive. You could check them out yourself. Um, the, uh, the, um, People sometimes talk about, oh, that's legendary. And they don't ask the questions, how long do legends take to grow? I mean, do they, like, they look like mushrooms after the rain. I mean, when, when you look at, for example, the life of Muhammad, the first life of Muhammad dates from about 150 years uh, after his death. That's a long time. The stories in the life of, of Buddha happened long afterwards. The gospel stories from Mark, uh, who, who traditionally uh, um, wrote his, his, his gospels based on the preaching and the, and the memoirs of St. Peter in, in, in Rome after Peter's martyrdom in about 65, 66, 80 or so. Then uh, Mark put all of his notes together in the Gospel of Mark and it was published after he got to Alexandria or so. Um, but that means that he is, uh, Peter is preaching, Mark's writing, and come to that Luke's writing, um, within about 30, maybe 40 years tops um, of, of the events. Of course, John, um, the St. John the Evangelist, St. John the Theologian, uh, claimed to be one of the 12 and an eyewitness. So I guess I guess he would know. The point is that's that's too early for legends to spring up. L legends spring up about, I don't know, St. Nicholas or St. George or things that happened lots and lots and lots and lots of time ago, but not 30 years ago. And the idea that modern men to say, well, 30 years is a long time. 30 years is nothing. You know, you have, people write their memoirs after 30 years. I, for example, remember the day I was married more than 30 years ago uh, in 1976. And it, I remember the day very well. The, the, important, the important things that happened 30 years ago, you don't forget, 30 years is nothing. So, and then that's, and that's, the important thing is that that's when the gospels were written. They were all written just a few decades afterwards by other people that were there or by people like Luke that checked out with the, and talked to the people that were there, um, including presumably the mother of God um, Luke was uh, uh, a friend of a friend of Paul's. Uh, traditionally, he was a resident of Antioch. So, if you're going to write the gospel and you're living in, in Antioch and you're the and you're the friend of Paul's, you think he wouldn't go to Jerusalem and check with the check with the apostles themselves? If the mother of God is a part of of that community, any journalist would go and talk to her. Presumably, he did. So, I would suggest that that's where the facts came from. It's not a matter of of uh, creating legends. There's a book by uh, Sunday afternoon. I want to say Raymond Brown called the birth the birth of of uh, the birth of of the Messiah, and I think a lot of uh, brilliant scholar that he is. A lot of scholars uh, embrace a non-patristic hermeneutic of suspicion, you know, and the the, the question is if they, if Luke had access to the facts, why would he embroider them? If Matthew and, and or his community uh, had access to the facts, why would you embroider them? I mean, especially because people 
want to know. If someone says, Father Lawrence, would you like to hear uh, uh, this someone that you admire profoundly? Would you like to hear what actually happened in their life? Or would you like to hear some stories that I made up about their, 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 their early life? I would say, well, I don't care about your stories. I want to know what actually happened to them. That's why I care about. Presumably, that's what the early Christians wanted to hear about too. If you have a choice between hearing what actually happened in Jesus' childhood or some stories that some idiot made up, of course you choose the former. So I'd suggest they, there was, I said, there was no Christian appetite for anything other than the truth. Or they were, they wanted to know history. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't want the creative writing. And it's significant that when you look at the early documents of the New Testament, uh, most of the liberal scholarship um, uh, um, the, tend to assume a high degree of creativity on the part of the New Testament authors. Um, there was this one uh, group of um, uh, people called the Jesus Seminar, here the Jesus Seminar, a bunch of, uh, forgive me, uh, yahoos who, are, who are, have, have embraced a hermeneutic of suspicion and they get to vote of, of uh, I'm not making this up. They would they voted on the reliability of the various sayings of the Lord using colored stones. If he, I think it was if he, if you if you're sure, if you think he might have said this, use was it was it a red stone or a pink stone, a little pebble. Uh, and if you're sure they didn't say it, you get it, it was the dreaded black pebble and stuff like this and stuff. You know, that's just stuff. And so um, uh, again, the embraces hermeneutic of suspicion, and their idea was that Jesus said almost practically nothing of the things that he's recorded to have said. He, uh, the um, uh, uh, nativity uh, stories are mostly just fabric fabrications, and that they were written within this tremendously creative um, uh, community called the early church uh, that had almost no concern for historicity, uh, seemingly an inability to differentiate between the historical uh, and uh, the legendary, uh, except, first of all, a, a couple of things. One is, that's not how the human heart works. If you love somebody, you want to know what actually happened because you love them. Um, but the other thing is that when you look at the epistles of the Apostle Paul themselves, you see this same concern to differentiate between what Christ said and what he actually uh, and, and what he and what he didn't say. So, for example, uh, take a take a couple of examples in the early church. Um, they uh, it was the first controversy to. Uh, rock the church was that of the gentile mission should the uh, can gentiles be accepted as gentiles or do, or do they have to become jews is it necessary for paul's converts uh, in syria and and cilicia to be circumcised or is baptism okay big controversy um, so they they debated the thing but no, nobody thought to produce a saying of jesus which said you know Verily I say unto thee, it's okay to, to bring them in without, without uh, circumcision. Or verily I say unto thee that these guys need to be circumcised. They, they, Jesus didn't address the thing. But, but, if, but if the Christian community was that creative, if it had some sort of uh, 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 machine producing sayings of Jesus, you know, at, you know, he said this, he said that, he said something else, you know, this... Uh, this uh, create a machine going full throttle, you wonder why it never created something that they needed, like that. Or for example, in the, take another example of Jesus's favorite uh, self-reference uh, um, self was to call himself the son of man. But he's never ever called that in the, in the church's early liturgy. He's never ever called that in the epistles. He's called Christ, he's called the Lord, he's, he's called by his name Jesus. Um, see something called the Lord of Glory, never called the Son of Man. So it seems that there was a difference between Christ, how he talked, and, and what, what was recorded in the Gospels, and what the church thought of him afterwards. One final, one final example. Um, the, the, the question of mixed marriages. You read, read all about it in 1 Corinthians 7. So the question is, uh, if you're, if you're, if, if, uh, if a believer is married to an unbeliever, what do you, you know, what do you do? So, um, and may Christians who don't get along divorce one another. So St. Paul deals with all of these questions in First, First Corinthians 7. And he said, if, if, you, if two people, if two Christians are married, they may not divorce. Let me read you the, least my Bible is right here. I can read you the, the relevant bits in First Corinthians 7. Hang on. 
Um, I guess the opponent's phraseology um, is, is significant. To the married, I give charge, this is verse 10, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband, and that uh, the husband should not divorce his wife. So when he says, uh, uh, I, I give charge, not I, but the Lord, what he means is that he is quoting a saying of Jesus, he, and that namely, his disciples don't get divorced, no how, no way, full stop, no exceptions. That's the Lord's teaching. Um, then he goes on to say, uh, to the rest, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And he, 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 he goes on. The point is, he said, to the rest, I say, not the Lord. What he's saying is that I, the Lord didn't talk about this. The, the Lord said his, his disciples shouldn't get divorced, but our Lord never addressed the issue and the question of what happens if you have a mixed marriage with a disciple of Jesus and a, 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 a pagan. So St. Paul says, well, I got, the Lord didn't, didn't teach about this, so here's my opinion. So, but the point is the church was, was uh, clear about what Jesus said and what Jesus didn't say. If these liberal scholars, the, the, the idiots from the Jesus seminar, for example, um, were correct, then this uh, creative machine, which is flying at full throttle all the time, should have, should have been producing, uh, uh, putting words into our Lord's mouth about uh, circumcision and uncircumcision and mixed marriages and, and all of this sort of stuff. But they didn't. All of these things that were very controversial, the church did not say that Jesus said this. So that in, in other words, the church was able to clearly differentiate between what Christ said and what he, and what he didn't say. And they, and they do not feel themselves free to create something and put it back into our Lord's mouth because they needed him to say that. There, so there was a tremendous conservatism about what Christ said and what he didn't say. And the idea of creating something and sticking it back into our Lord's mouth was anathema. The other thing, the last little point, is that as soon as you emerge from the apostolic period of, of the first century into the, the so-called sub-apostolic period, you know, the period of Ignatius and uh, Justin Martyr and Polycarp and all those guys. The church was very, very conservative. They, they, they were not creative. They said, here's what Christ said, and we're not going to go beyond that. If, if the liberals are right, then what that means is that the first century church was wildly creative and thought nothing of inventing stories and sayings and attributing them to Christ um, and, and uh, no problem. And then somehow instantly throughout all of the church, this period of uh, freedom and creativity ceased, vanished without a trace, and was replaced by the by the by the church saying, "We have to go by what the what Christ historically said in the Gospels, and we are not free to create stuff." And when people did feel themselves free to create stuff, namely the Gnostics, uh, the church said, "No, no, you're out. If you're going to do that, get out." Uh, sense like that. So, um, I would suggest, therefore, that the the church has always had a concern to differentiate the legendary from the historical. And they said, uh, the legends about Christ are, are, are not on. And so you get, like, like I said, in, this, in the uh, second century, for example, you have these idiot stories in some of the infancy gospels about uh, Jesus creating little birds of clay and clapping his hands and they come alive and fly away and stuff like this. Or there was one time when I think Joseph was um, working in the carpenter shop and the, we cut the board to too, too, too short, and Christ did a miracle and lengthened the board, you know, stupid stuff like that. And the church said, no, this is not, first of all, these miracles are stupid. Um, um, and no, they're non-historical. But if the church, if, if Raymond Brown and the Jesus Seminar people are correct, the church should have just embraced that and said, absolutely. Never met a, never met a legend I didn't love, you know. But the church said, yeah, no, with, legends are out, history is in. The church was rigorously historical from the word from the word go. So what that tells me is that if you're reading uh, the infancy narratives of of, of, of Luke and Ma and Matthew, um, the the how do you say it? If the if the uh, if the rest of the gospels are to be understood historically, then then the infancy gospels are are historically as well. You get in Luke's gospel, for example, it jumps into history in the beginning of chapter 
three. You know that he's being very historical because he said, okay, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis and Lysianus, tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, and, and on it goes. So he dates the thing according to all the various markers, historical markers of the, of the time. He clearly believes that he is writing history. So if he's going to start to write history in chapter three, I would suggest he's writing history in chapter one and two. He started off by saying, opening verses of Luke's gospel, I checked this with a bunch of eyewitnesses, and I'm writing to you an accurate, orderly account of what actually happened. Um, he's got this concern for history in chapter three, but he dates it according to historical markers of the time. But we're able to check it, his math in the Acts of the Apostles. We, we, we realize his math is actually pretty accurate. Um, but we can, the, the titles that he's using were the actual titles of the time. The guy's done his homework. So I'd suggest all of, at the very least, it shifts the burden of proof onto the skeptics to say, you think that that didn't happen, why would you, why would you say that? You need to, since Luke has such a good track record and claimed to be writing history, and the church ever after read him as, as, writing, as writing history. The church didn't read the infancy narratives and say, well, that's legendary. Ain't it pretty? And then you get into the, the ministry of Jesus, and now we're, we have left the realm of legend for the realm of sober, of sober, of sober history. It never happens. The church read it as if it was historical throughout. So I would suggest that having the historical, uh, the the patristic mindset means that we read it as history throughout. Again, ancient history, history as the ancients wrote it and not as modern journalists and historians would write it, uh, but it meant to be a history of the ancient this, and not the legends of the ancients. Anyway, that would be my suggestion and probably the reason why I'll never have tenure at a modern uh, uh, secular seminary. Thank you. I'm, uh, dear friends, if you have uh, uh, questions for Father Lawrence, please, you can turn your microphones on and ask a question. Oh, there was there is a, a little bit different question, but to you. Father Lawrence, why did you convert it to orthodoxy? That's from a, a gentleman named George from Serbia. Um, I converted to orthodoxy because it occurred to me when I started to look at the ecclesiological question that I was in the wrong place. I was an Anglican priest. I was uh, born in the United Church of Canada, which I think is kind of like the United Church of Christ in the United States. Um, uh, fell away, became a, a, a dumb idiot kid agnostic, um, and then started to be drawn back to faith in Christ through the charismatic Jesus people in the 1970s. Yep, I'm that old. Um, and then, you know, the, the more you, you get into the thing, you realize that church needs to have some roots. The, the United Church in which I was born was created out of three other denominations in 1925. Uh, my mother, however, was created in 1920, and I figured the church at least be a little older than your mom. So I was looking around to find an ancient church. So if you're Protestant, you don't fish outside the Protestant pool. So the ancient church available to me at the time was the Anglican Church of Canada, known in, in the U.S. as the Episcopal Church. And so I became uh, an Anglican. Uh, um, was ordained by the, for, the, for the Anglicans in 1979, went out to serve under a wonderful bishop in uh, the Prairie, provinces of, uh, Prairie Province of Saskatchewan uh, for six years, um, and had my two girls, uh, well, my wife and the two girls, and then, um, and then the, as the Anglican Church started to get more and more liberal, I asked myself, the, the ordination of women and uh, allowing questions about the divinity of Christ and stuff like this, I thought, What's the deal whereby the church can get very, very liberal? Maybe I'm, because the fathers would never, I kept reading the fathers more and more deeply and I thought this is, this is not consistent with the, with the early fathers. And so, I, so um, the more I thought about Anglicanism, the more I thought uh, Anglicanism and, and Protestantism generally is a well-intentioned and glorious mistake that they went into schism from the church and after, uh, uh, chewing on it and praying about it and thinking about it a lot because um, it means that I am now unemployed <laughs> and out of a job with two uh, very young daughters. Um, uh, I concluded that 
the apostolic church, the church that Jesus founded, the church that I was confessing in the creed, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church was the Orthodox church. So I thought, well, shoot, because I'm in the Anglican church in Northern Saskatchewan. So I guess I gotta, I guess I gotta get out. So for me, it, was, it wasn't just that the Orthodox church was so wonderful, I mean, it is, but that wasn't, you know, I was not attracted by this beautiful the, uh, liturgy, by its uh, deep spiritual tradition. I was not attracted by its beautiful iconography. I mean, that was all great. But for me, it was an ecclesiological issue. I came to believe as, as I looked at history and what happened in the East and the West with the schism, I thought, well, I ended up being born on the wrong side of the schism. And Protestantism was a schism from the schism. There were a lot of things that Rome did wrong. And the, the, a number of people in the West, uh, later came to be known as Anglicans, Lutherans, Mennonites, and God knows what, uh, were right in thinking that Rome was doing it wrong. Uh, the sensible thing for them to be to have done was to come home to Orthodoxy. But of course, that wasn't much of a historical option back then, in the 50, in the 16th century. Um, so, like I said, it was it was a well-intentioned mistake, I would suggest. And so, there's there, for me, there was nothing for it but. Uh, having thought about the ecclesiological issues to, to, to come home to orthodoxy, resign my Anglican priesthood, uh, be chrismated two weeks later, God save me, zero catechism, uh, praise God for, you know, Schmemann's books or something like that, um, uh, and going to go back to an orthodox seminary to try to uh, keep on reading and keep on learning and, and that. So for me, uh, the, the, the conversion was brought on by a crisis of liberalism in the Anglican Church where I was that forced me to examine the underlying uh, ecclesiological issues. Short version. Sorry, uh, my microphone was muted. So thank you, you helped me with my faith. That's a comment from George. Uh, dear friends, any other questions, please? Don't be hesitant, turn your microphones on, cameras, and you know, these meetings are arranged for you and for your interaction. Huh? No? All right. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right. Well, Father, thank you so much for your presence and for your absolutely wonderful presentation. I wish you a very healthy year and hope maybe that you'll visit us at some point in the future again. So please pray for us all and I will. I May will. And it be uh, most uh, blessed year. Dear friends, thank you very much for coming and hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.